Dearly loved friends, good evening. And a very warm welcome to each of you to the second session of our Serving the Divine Plan program. One month ago, this program was launched here in this auditorium. And in its letter of 9 October 2005 about the program, the Universal House of Justice explained to us its purpose. We feel is it imperative for the friends here, especially for short-term staff, to remain current with the learning that is taking place in the field and to use the period of their service to strengthen their understanding of Baha'u'llah's vision for world order and the part of his followers are to play towards its realization. It is my pleasure to introduce to you this evening's speaker, Mr. Paul Lampo, who will be addressing us on the subject of knowledge. I don't know if any of you have been in a situation in which you were asked to introduce someone, and when you suggested to him beforehand what you might say, he or she replied, oh, don't say that. <laughs> oh, for sure, don't say that. And in this particular case, he even said I could say, Mr. Lample refused to allow me to say much. <laughs> and he fish finished by saying, well, whatever you do, please make it short. <laughs> Such is my challenge this evening. Mr. Paul Lample has been a Baha'i since 1977. He was invited to serve at the Baha'i World Center in the Office of Social and Economic Development in 1994 and was appointed to the International Teaching Center in 2003 and elected as a member of the Universal House of Justice in March of 2005. He is well-traveled, particularly because of his years in OSED and as a member of the Teaching Center and has authored various study materials and more recently a book entitled Creating a New Mind. On a more personal note, Mr. Lampo met his wife, Marsha, on a teaching trip. And they have three lovely children, two currently living outside of Israel, and the third, May, is with all of us here in Haifa. Dear friends, I'm sure you are eagerly awaiting Mr. Lampel's presentation as am I. For the sake of brevity, and in order to remain faithful to my instructions, I ask you to please join me now in welcoming our speaker for this evening, Mr. Paul Lampel. Good evening, friends. The topic that we're, is under consideration tonight, knowledge, is uh, a, a subject about which there are many statements in the Baha'i writings. Baha'u'llah states, No, knowledge is as a wings to man's life and a ladder for his ascents. Its acquisition is incumbent upon everyone. In truth, Knowledge is a veritable treasure for man and a source of glory, of bounty, of joy, of exultation, of cheer and gladness unto him. Abdu'l Baha also stresses the importance of acquiring knowledge. He said that the primary, the most urgent requirement is the promotion of education. It is inconceivable that any nation should achieve prosperity and success unless this paramount, this fundamental concern, is carried forward. The principal reason for the decline and fall of peoples is ignorance. And he adds, there are certain pillars which have been established as the unshakable supports of the faith of God. The mightiest of these is learning and the use of the mind, the expansion of consciousness and insight into the realities of the universe and the hidden mysteries of Almighty God. To promote knowledge is thus an inescapable duty imposed on every one of the friends of God. Now, the topic of knowledge is vast and complex, 
Human beings have been reflecting on this subject for thousands of years, and no doubt uh, Baha'is will continue to consider different dimensions of this topic throughout the course of the entire dispensation. So since I don't have that long, I'm going to have to summarize a bit. Knowledge is important to us because it has implications for who we are and what we should do, what's right and what's wrong, what kind of world and what kind of society we should work for. Whether we're talking about knowledge of the world or knowledge of the revelation, knowledge is not just a body of information that we accumulate. It's about the kind of understanding that effectively helps us to shape ourselves and the world. So knowledge and reality are intertwined. Now, well, actually, the, the whole scope of how far the human mind can reach touches on various aspects of knowledge, but the focus of this talk will basically be on knowledge in relationship to the revelation of Baha'u'llah. And I should say at the beginning that these are my personal views on the subject. So as you listen, you should compare them with your own thoughts and your own study. The aim of this talk is really to help shape our attitudes and our approaches to the question of knowledge. And it relates particularly to this program as you consider how will I serve, what will my future be, how will I pursue education or my profession. Now, we're living in a particular time when there is a crisis concerning the question of knowledge. It's an age of skepticism and doubt. Humanity no longer has a basis for agreement about what constitutes knowledge. And what we do understand leads us to have grave concerns about the nature of what we know. Just before the time of Baha'u'llah, in Western philosophy, there was what they called a Copernican revolution in the understanding about knowledge. Uh, you know, Copernicus was the one who uh, presented the theory that it was not the uh, sun that traveled around the earth. The earth was not the center of the solar system, but the sun was the center of the solar system. So he inverted the understanding about the physical world. And toward the end of the uh, 1700s, the philosopher Immanuel Kant presented some ideas that changed inverted the view of people about the concept of knowledge. Up to that point, people largely felt that knowledge was centered around the object under study. So if we looked at the planet, or we looked at the concept of an economic system or whatever, knowledge was in that thing outside of us. The object of knowledge was the center of knowledge. But then Kant realized that actually the human being, the way a human being thinks, the way they reason, the way they look at the world, actually interferes with having a real understanding of a particular object. The individual human being shapes the, the concept of knowledge. Now, a number of individuals have added to this thinking over the past couple hundred years, and today we have kind of two paradigms that are in conflict with one another. One is the view of modernism, and this is the idea that Knowledge is something that we can obtain about a particular object. We can have sure knowledge. Knowledge is defined as true, justified belief. It's something we have a belief about. We have a good reason for believing that thing. And that thing is true about the object under study. There's a correspondence theory of truth. That if we have truth, it means that we understand the way things really are out there about that particular thing that's under study. So to possess knowledge is to have an understanding about the way things really are. Now, how this translates in society is that because you have knowledge, because you have an understanding of moral values, or you have an understanding of how an economic system works, or you have an understanding of how the physical world works, it means that now that you have that truth, that you can shape the society on the basis of that understanding. So gradually the economic system, the justice system, the political system are all based on a solid understanding of truth and knowledge about the world around us and about human nature. This, the character of this kind of knowledge 
uh, is particularly scientific in its outlook. It's positivistic in the sense that it's certain about what it knows. In other words, if we give enough time and we give enough money to science, it will eventually answer all of our questions. It's encyclopedic in nature in the sense that there's a body of information and we need to accumulate that body and understand it. It's reductionistic in the sense that you can keep breaking knowledge down into smaller and smaller bits, which adds to the body of knowledge, and then we accumulate that. And so in this sense, knowledge is power. Because if you have knowledge, then you have truth, and you can compel people to acknowledge the truth and follow what you have presented to them. Now, in the competing view that grew out of this shift of knowledge that was centered around the human being, uh, this is the postmodern view, postmodern thought. In postmodern thought, knowledge is what people agree it is. The word truth doesn't really even have any meaning. Reality itself can't be known, just our opinions about reality. So everybody has a different viewpoint, and we can't say whose view is more correct than somebody else's, so rather than certitude, we have relativism. All views are equally good. They have something to say. In this context, there's an understanding that reality is really social reality. In other words, most of what constitutes the reality for human beings is not physics or biology or chemistry. It's the things that we create together, like the concept of money, for example. Money, there's a piece of paper or even a bar of gold or a blip on a computer screen. That represents money. But there's no physical reality to it that means anything. It's because we agree that it has a certain value. That is why it has value. And if we agree that it has no value, suddenly it has no value. Most of what we have in terms of society, the institutions of society, an economic system, uh, an agricultural system, all of these things are based on human understanding and the institutions that human beings have raised uh, in their interactions with one another. Now, uh, this social reality is constructed from our agreement. It also means that it can be deconstructed. As we study it, as we expose the thinking behind some of these things, we can expose some of the maybe injustices or power plays that were involved in making this structure. And as we expose it, we take it apart. So it's kind of like the human race is like the kid who has now grabbed a screwdriver and has taken apart his computer and is now learning how to take the pieces apart. So they've become very good at taking the pieces apart, but what they don't know too well at this point is how do you put them back together in the right way? Uh, people no longer believe in postmodern thought in big, the big picture. In, the, in big stories about how human progress has taken place, in, uh, in the stories about evolution or the Big Bang as the way that we got here physically. Uh, if you talk about world peace and how you can establish world peace, well, you must be either, one, masking some kind of totalitarian impulse where you're going to force your views on the world, or you're hopelessly naive. There's no way that this could ever come about, so it's ridiculous to even talk about it. The nature of knowledge in this context is discursive. People talk. They talk back and forth. They discuss, and they agree on what constitutes knowledge. Like you have a community of scientists, and they determine, well, what are our methods? What are our means of justification? Think of a community of astronomers, and an astrologer shows up to give a talk at a conference. What happens? He's not going to let them in because his criteria of what constitutes knowledge doesn't match the criteria of those astronomers. The problem with a dialogue, a process of dialogue for finding knowledge, is it's easy to disrupt that dialogue. Anybody comes along and they argue and they force their opinions and they refuse to let agreement occur, well then they can disrupt the whole process of pursuing knowledge. So in this context, in the postmodern context, power is knowledge a complete reversal, because those who have power decide what constitutes knowledge. So you have a tobacco company that pays a lot of money to do scientific research on whether cigarettes cause cancer. And lo and behold, it doesn't. <laughs> so this is an example. 
And the debate between these two points of view traps the human race in a kind of either or, between certainty or doubt. Either we can have a way to get true knowledge or it's hopeless and all we have is different opinions and uh, different points of view and uh, we just have to bob about uh, without having any certainty at all. It creates the division between fundamentalism and liberalism, between this positive certainty and this idea of relativism. And all the disciplines of human endeavor are caught up in this debate. In the sciences, they have this debate between the social sciences and the natural sciences. Over the past decade, they've called the science wars. In journalism, you have one television station talking about terrorists. You turn the channel, the same group is talking about freedom fighters. In the field of philosophy, some philosophers have suggested that philosophy should just come to an end because it's been about the study of a kind of knowledge that doesn't exist anymore and can't be understood. So in this sense, we can see that postmodernism, if you think about the term postmodern, basically it means after modernism. It doesn't even know what it is. It just knows it isn't modernism. It doesn't like that. So postmodernism then isn't really a competing idea opposed to modernism. What it is is a kind of interrogation, an investigation, probing the weaknesses of modernism, asking questions that modernism can't answer. I mean, we can't have a world without justice, without uh, order, without uh, some kind of uh, economic system and so on. But if you doubt the foundations of all these things, well, how do you get along? And that's where we are now. And so in that sense, from a Baha'i perspective, we can see these questions coming from postmodernism as a kind of diagnosis of the disintegration of the old world order. The old world order is crumbling. People see it. They don't believe in a lot of aspects, and they start asking questions about it. So, and then we can also see, as we look into the revelation of Baha'u'llah, that Baha'u'llah has come at this time when these questions have arose, when human civilization is undergoing this change. And he's provided answers, a different way of looking at knowledge that particularly addresses these concerns that are raised in postmodern thought. Now, what I like to do, I can't give a comprehensive view. and It's too premature to say what's a Baha'i perspective on knowledge. Uh, even if I had more time, I don't think I could do it. Maybe a thousand years or so. But what I'd like to do with you is share five ideas, five um, uh, aspects that would have to be contained in some way in a Baha'i view about knowledge. The first is uh, the idea of revelation itself. Revelation provides us with access to a, a unique and a particular kind of knowledge. So we have to understand how does this work? What is revelation? Historically, religion has kind of been the archetype of certain knowledge. Like Jesus talked about the fact that a man should not build his house on the sand because then when the water comes, it washes the house away. Rather, uh, a believer should be like a person who builds their house on a rock and it has a firm foundation and then you can raise the structure on top of it. And when the storm comes, it doesn't blow away. And the word of God is seen as this rock. So religion traditionally is the source of this sure knowledge. It must be absolutely true. Now, Baha'u'llah, on the other hand, talks to us about, and the, and the other statements in the Baha'i writings point out to us that divine revelation is not absolute knowledge. It's relative. What does that mean? Well, we know from the Baha'i writings we can think about knowledge on three levels. The knowledge of God that's vastly beyond anything we can conceive, even some aspects of which even the manifestation of God can't encompass. Then we have the knowledge of the manifestation of God. He's omniscient. He understands all, far above our capacity to understand. And then you have human knowledge with all of its limitations. So the manifestation of God, understanding 
far beyond anything we can imagine about the nature of reality, and also understanding human limitation, then shapes a revelation that fits the human race at a particular time in history. If it's all knowledge, then what does the next manifestation of God come and tell us? It's not all knowledge. It's all knowledge we can bear right now. So he sees the reality, but he also sees the limits. He gives milk to the babes. You know, as we grow stronger, as we gain more capacity, revelation can provide us with more truths. Abdul Baha talks about the idea that uh, in the dispensation of Muhammad, Muhammad adapted many of the laws of his dispensation from uh, the, the practices in the days of ignorance, you know, the, the practices that were current among the people. And Abdul Baha says, can one God forbid assume that because some of the divine laws resemble the practices of the days of ignorance, the customs of a people abhorred by all nations, it follows that there's a defect in these laws? Or can one, God forbid, imagine that the omnipotent Lord was moved to comply with the opinions of the heathen? So why? Would it have been impossible for Muhammad to reveal a law which bore no resemblance whatsoever to any practice current in the days of ignorance? Abdul Baha says, rather the purpose of his consummate wisdom was to free the people from the chains of fanaticism which had bound them hand and foot, and to forestall those very objections which today confuse the mind and trouble the conscience of the simple and the helpless. So he ties the law into what people could understand in order to lift them to a higher place. And if he had presented those laws above the human capacity to understand, they would have rejected it. So revelation in that sense is adapted. It's, it's a truth that's adapted to the current capacity of human beings to understand. Now, in this uh, understanding of revelation, we have to recognize the fact that it's immutable for human beings. In other words, even though it was shaped by the manifestation of God, no one else has the power to change it until the coming of the next manifestation. So at the level of the knowledge of the manifestation, we can see that it's not a reflection of the reality that exists in the mind of God. It's an adaptation of that to human knowledge. But as far as human beings are concerned, there's no way to change it until the coming of the next manifestation. And Baha'u'llah tells us there's an intended meaning in that revelation. We can't believe anything we want about it. Our, 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 there's a demand that we strive to understand what that meaning is. Just because, as Shoghi Effendi said, religious truth is relative, doesn't mean that religious truth is subjective. So we can't take it to mean anything we want it to mean. We have to try to, try to understand that meaning. Now, individual views can be wrong. They can be partial. They can evolve over time. That's the nature of studying, learning, and striving to understand. And that's our responsibilities as believers. There's some explicit facts in the revelation. We know that we shouldn't drink, and maybe except for some debates on the side about whether or not you can use vanilla extract or anything, we know we shouldn't drink. But most of the things that are most meaningful about the revelation are not explicit. They're, they're uh, bound in the depths of the revelation. For example, how do you create an economic system that eliminates extremes of wealth and poverty? Shoghi Effendi tells us Baha'u'llah wasn't an economist. He didn't create an economic system. But he put principles and concepts and ideas and methods which Baha'i economists can work with over the centuries to finally figure out what that will be. What is a new world order? What is a Baha'i educational system? How do you uh, eliminate prejudice? All of these things, there's, the teachings are there, but it's not a simple recipe. It's not a simple formula. We have to learn over time. How do you sustain entry by troops? Also not a recipe, but something that we're paying a lot of attention to right now. So the principles that guide our capacity to interpret the text and our ability to act on it are both found uh, in the revelation. So this is one point, the nature of revelation. The second point I want to talk about is 
that the aim of the faith, what we're trying to create, the kingdom of God on earth, a divine civilization, is a social reality. As Jesus talked about, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're trying to create a social reality, an organization of world order, a political system, an economic system that reflects the will of God. This begins first when we recognize and obey the teachings. We recognize Baha'u'llah says mankind is one. So we believe it. On a deep level, we have unity of thought about that. But now how do we translate that principle into concrete action? The world doesn't agree with us. People have different views. Systems exist that, that promote one race over the other. How do we change those? We can't go to war to exterminate it. We go to, in a sense, an intellectual war. We bring Baha'u'llah's ideas forward. We practice ourselves, learn how to practice those ideas ourselves. And we engage other groups of people, other nations, other religions, other populations, and share these ideas and try to influence their thinking and shape their thinking so that they agree. One concept, one Baha'i concept that's gained wide acceptance in the world now is the idea of if you educate the girl child, that's the best thing you can do to stimulate social and economic development. This is an idea that the Baha'i community has promoted and suggested at the UN and other uh, gatherings, but it's also an idea which, from their own experience, development specialists have recognized and acknowledged, and now it's made uh, a part of development practice. So Abdu'l Baha tells us that in this particular stage, the antiquated forms of belief and ancestral imitations that are at variance with the foundations of divine reality must pass away and be reformed. So he tells us we need new morals. The intellect of humanity must change. New remedies and new solutions for human problems have to be adopted. Old sciences are useless today. Ethical precedents don't fit. There needs to be a new social reality, and this social reality needs to reflect the principles and concepts that Baha'u'llah presented. This unfolds over time. The House of Justice described it as an organic process, much like the development of a tree. If a farmer plants a tree, he cannot state at that moment what its exact height will be, the number of its branches, or the exact time of its blossoming. He can, however, give a general impression of its size and pattern of growth and can state with confidence which fruit it will bear. The same is true of the evolution of the world order of Baha'u'llah. So it's not a recipe. It's not a formula. We can't state with certainty how it's going to come out, what's the timetable, how it's going to play out. But we can understand that it's a process of understanding the teaching and translating them into action in our own lives and in the life of society to restructure the social reality till it reflects the will of God on earth. The third point I want to make is the idea that human knowledge is limited. Abdu'l Baha tells us that all ways of human knowing are limited. Reason, the senses, tradition or study of the text, inspiration. All of these ways are limited. Human beings have a limited capacity to know. We can't know the essence of a thing, Abdu'l Baha tells us. All we can do is kind of cross check all these ways of knowing against one another. That's the best we can do. Shoghi Effendi reminds us that we can't have uh, an, a, fully, a full comprehension of the revelation that Baha'u'llah gave us. All we can do is struggle for more adequate insights. He says, an exact and thorough comprehension of so vast a system, so sublime a revelation, so sacred a trust, is for obvious reasons beyond the reach and ken of our finite minds. We can, however, and it is our bounden duty, to seek to strive fresh inspiration and added sustenance as we labor for the propagation of his faith through a clear apprehension of the truths it enshrines and the principles on which it is based. So think again of these three levels. There's a gap between what Baha'u'llah has revealed and what we understand. And we have to be very conscious of that gap. That gap 
preserves our humility. We can't say, I know, and you don't know. We always have to say, these are my views. Maybe I'm wrong. This is one way of looking at it. Let's learn together. And gradually, over the course of the dispensation, try to close that gap between what we understand and what uh, Baha'u'llah has said. If at any point we're absolutely certain that that gap is closed, that our understanding is the same as what Baha'u'llah said, that opens the door to fundamentalism. Because now it's like Baha'u'llah said this, and if you don't agree, you know, you're not firm in the covenant. Agree with what? Agree with what I think Baha'u'llah said, or agree with what Baha'u'llah actually said? So if we preserve this humility, the faith continues to advance. We learn over time. Abdu Baha tells us that human minds differ. He said, it is clear that the reality of mankind is diverse, that opinions are various, and sentiments differ. And this difference of opinions, of thoughts, of intelligence, of sentiments among the human species arises from essential necessity. God made us different. God made us to think different. And this diversity of thought is actually a strength for the human race. Abdul Baha says it should be like musical notes. And when they're organized in a pro proper way, then we have harmony. He says it's like the different limbs and organs of the human body. They all have something to offer. And when they're harmonized, then the body uh, has all of its power. And it's the word of God that is intended to harmonize and unify this diverse thinking. Now, if we have diversity of thought, but we're united under the word of God, then what happens? Each of our different ways of perceiving reality contributes to the advancement of the whole because we have consultation as a means to distill our understanding, and we can advance together. And if we don't allow those views to be harmonized, we're stuck in an endless debate, endlessly circular. We never know what's right and wrong. We never have a way of harmonizing our thinking. Shoghi Effendi reminds us that there's no liberalism, no fundamentalism in the Baha'i faith. This dichotomous way of thinking, certainty or doubt, that comes from modernism and postmodernism can creep into the Baha'i community because we're in the world. We're educated in it. We're trained in these different fields. We can't move ahead without being influenced by modernist thought or postmodern thought, but we have to be careful about how we bring those ideas into the Baha'i community. Shoghi Effendi said, there can and should be no liberals or conservatives, no moderates or extremes in the cause, for they are all, we are all subject to one and the same law, which is the law of God. He urges you to exert your utmost to get the Baha'is to put aside such obnoxious terms as radical, conservative, progressive, enemies of the cause, squelching the teachings. If the Baha'is pause for one moment to think for what purpose the Bab and the martyrs gave their lives, and Baha'u'llah and the Master accepted so much suffering, they would never let such definitions and accusations cross their lips when speaking of each other. As long as the friends quarrel amongst themselves, their efforts will not be blessed, for they are disobeying God. Now, we should consider these quotes the next time somebody wants to frame some aspect of our discussion along these lines. Liberalism and fundamentalism is the fruit of the clash of points of view that have dominated contemporary thinking. Both of these avenues of thought, modernism and postmodernism, like debate. They like public debate. They like argumentation. In modernism, if you argue, the truth is supposed to appear. This is how truth comes. So in the legal system, in the political system, you have debate, you have argumentation. In postmodernism, since truth doesn't exist anyway, you have to argue just to keep people from imposing their view of truth on you. So both like to argue. Now, this idea that human minds differ, that we think differently, should give rise to many different opinions about the meaning of the text, and this is good. We need different views. We need insightful views. We need profound views about the meaning of the text. But these differences of view can't be permitted to create sects or divisions 
or schools of thought that contend with each other and that create a sense of us and them. Because the Baha'i community has been created to eliminate the concept of us and them in the world as a whole. So if we can't even eliminate it in our own community, how are we going to play this part in contributing to the unity of the world? The fourth point uh, this is another aspect in terms of our thinking about knowledge is the idea that consultation is the means for acquiring collective understanding and for applying knowledge. Baha'u'llah says that in all things it is necessary to consult, for it is and will always be a cause of awareness and of awakening and a source of good and well-being. He says the maturity of the gift of understanding is made manifest through consultation. Now, in consultation, we're governed by a number of principles. Everybody is free to put forward their views, and nobody's permitted to obstruct and prevent somebody from putting forward their views or be offended by the views of others. The opinions are supposed to be presented without argumentation, without rancor. Conflict and contention are strictly forbidden, and if they arise, discussion is supposed to cease until unity has been restored. We know that the clash of differing opinions brings forth the spark of truth, but this isn't the end of it. All are supposed to listen for the truth in those different opinions. And when they hear the truth, they give up their own opinion and they embrace that other idea because Abdu baha tells us that reality lies where opinions coincide. So for this reason, to argue to stubbornly cling to your own opinion means that the truth will remain hidden. We don't agree that argumentation brings forth truth. We believe that consultation in the spirit of these principles brings forth truth. There's one talk where Abdu Baha explains a certain visit that he had uh, to visit the French parliament. And uh, as he was observing their deliberations, he saw them argue with one another, even one a couple people got into a scuffle. Uh, he said, antagonism and contradiction are unfortunate and always destructive to the truth. In this meeting, he said, it wasn't consultation, but comedy. So, in this view of... Uh, modernism and postmodernism as they think about discussion. Um, there are rules that govern uh, their discourse. For example, the rules of logic. If you're a scholar, if you're an academic, and you engage in scholarly discourse, and somebody violates rules of logic, well, their argument doesn't win the day. It's proven by the weakness of that argument, by its faultiness, not to, to hold true. In parliaments, there are parliamentary procedures. So if people can learn these ideas about how to engage in dialogue, why can't they learn about the process of consultation? And indeed, in the Baha'i community, we're teaching people, no matter, even from childhood, to learn how to engage in consultation. Uh, whether they're educated, whether they're not. They can all learn how to effectively engage in consultation. So the idea that people can sit and consult and talk is not naive. It's not something utopian. It's something that's very practical and which Baha'is are learning to do in populations around the world every day. Now, the process of consultation requires self-discipline. These principles I talked about can't be enforced by a local assembly or a national assembly. You can't sanction everybody every time they won't uh, give up their own opinion. So it's necessary for individuals to discipline themselves. You can't say everything you want when you want to say it. You can't yell at somebody. You can't um, impose your opinion. You can't suppress somebody else's view. If you do, the truth will remain hidden the consultative process will be disrupted. But the more we can learn how to be effective in applying these principles, the more consultation becomes a source of illumination, 
a way of justifying our knowledge, understanding it, collectively understanding it, and a way of applying it in reality. The last point I want to emphasize in terms of uh, aspects of a Baha'i approach to knowledge is the role of action in our understanding. Knowledge in a Baha'i perspective is inseparably bound with action. The purpose of religion isn't to describe reality as it is. Baha'u'llah has not come with an encyclopedia of information to describe reality to us. He's come in order to recreate the world order, to make a new social reality, to change us and to change the world around us. Interpretation of the text doesn't stand on its own. To test the truth of our understanding, we have to apply it in the field of action. As in science, where theories are tested through experimentation, spiritual insights also have to be attested by their expression in the physical world. The aim is to give an effective material form to spiritual truths. So we interpret the text and we have meaning. But meaning has to be tested in action, and that action shapes reality. It is incumbent upon every man of understanding, insight and understanding, Baha'u'llah states, to strive to translate that which hath been written into reality and action. To live the life means to comprehend the word of God and then to act on it. And Baha'u'llah affirms that the object of every revelation is to effect a transformation in the whole character of mankind, a transformation that manifests itself both outwardly and inwardly, and that shall affect both the inner life and external conditions. Otherwise, he says, the futility of God's universal manifestation is apparent. Shoghi Effendi invites us to participate in the Baha'i community. He says, this is a living laboratory where we can take the insights of the teaching and learn how to apply them in action. So both of these things, he says, should go hand in hand. Study of the teachings and practice of the teachings in the administrative teaching and other aspects of the faith. Now, in a certain sense, we can't say that we have knowledge until we can demonstrate this knowledge in action in the world. If I claim to be able to educate children, and then you look at the product of that education, and those children are rude, and they don't have spiritual qualities, and they, they can't govern themselves, and they can't be productive members of society. Well, what does that say about my educational process? Not too much. If I memorize a lot of quotations about teaching the faith, if I give lots of talks about it, I could write a book about it. But if my community doesn't grow, if I have no ability to participate in the field of teaching and actually help people to become Baha'is, well, what does that say really about my knowledge about teaching? So the, our knowledge of the faith is dependent on our capacity to translate it into action in the world. Now, again, these are just pieces. It's going to take centuries of thinking and gradually developing a more comprehensive view of a Baha'i approach to knowledge. But just as we understand these differences between our own thinking and the ideas that are dominating contemporary thought, it gives us a way of pr approaching certain kinds of questions in a very different way. So, for example, somebody writes to the House of Justice, and they say, uh, is the Baha'i faith about a bunch of do's and don'ts? In other words, we just read what Baha'u'llah said, or we hear what the House of Justice says, and then we have to do it. Or isn't it supposed to be that we support independent thought, that people can express their views, that they can have their own ideas, that they can do the things they want to do? Which one is it? Either or. Either the writings tell us exactly what to do, or we're kind of left on our own to figure it out for ourselves and have our own opinions about it. This is obviously a question framed in this debate in contemporary thought. And the way to answer the question is to push aside that either or, push aside that dichotomy. The Baha'i writings offer a very different insight. First of all, the very concept of laws. Yes, we have divine laws, and those things do tell us what we need to do. 
But those laws don't dictate every aspect of our life. They set boundaries for us, and they have a very particular purpose. If you look at the city of Haifa, and you want to move a lot of cars around the city of Haifa during rush hour, you need traffic laws. If you don't have those do's and don'ts, no traffic is going to move. If you want freedom, you need the order that's given by those laws. And if you're released from that and you're able to figure out the way you want traffic to work, I think there are actually a few people like that out there, <laughs> then you see very quickly traffic doesn't move at all. So the laws are like that. Uh, the laws are designed to frame reality for us, to actually give us freedom to explore what's important about human life. And Abdu Baha tells us that the moderate freedom which guarantees the welfare of the world of mankind and maintains and preserves the universal relationships is found in its fullest power and extension in the teachings of Baha'u'llah. Now, even though we have those laws, that doesn't mean that the Baha'i teachings reduce to a set of do's and don'ts. When somebody wrote to the House of Justice inquiring about certain aspects of the teachings, uh, particularly those related to sex, the House of Justice wrote back that it's neither possible nor desirable for the Universal House of Justice to set forth a set of rules covering every situation. It's up to the individual to understand the teachings, to understand the complex reality that they live in, and to apply the disciplines so that they can live up to the spirit of the teachings, not just apply some arbitrary set of do's and don'ts, some arbitrary recipe for how to be a human being. And in another uh, statement, the House of Justice explained that the text and the authoritative interpretations and the statements of the House of Justice don't lead to a progressive narrowing of possibilities. In fact, they open up possibilities. They said, if you study the writings of Abdu Baha and The Guardian, you will see how tremendously they differ from the interpretations of ministers and the church. They're not a progressive fossilization of the revelation. They are, for the most part, expositions which throw a clear light upon passages which may have been considered obscure. They point up the intimate relationship between various teachings. They expound the implications of scriptural allusions. And they educate the Baha'is in the tremendous significances of the words of Baha'u'llah. Rather than any way supplanting the words of the manifestation, they lead us back to them time and again. We can see that how this works in the experience in the Baha'i world with teaching since 1996. The process of entry by troops began even during the lifetime of Shoghi Effendi. And for almost four decades, we were free to explore whatever way we could possibly think about how to sustain this process. And we tried everything, and it didn't work. And in 1996, the House of Justice began to frame our experience in a way that put us on a different path, a way of thinking more systematically, a way of working together in unity, a way of creating a culture of learning about how we grow and developing human resources. Now, in this focus that we've had in the past 10 years, have we become shackled? Is it a bunch of do's and don'ts? Are we asked to think less? No, this process won't work. It's not a recipe. It's not a formula. You can't read seven Ruhi books and expect entry by troops in your town the day after you finish. It's about thinking. It's about learning. It's about working hard. So in the process of giving us this guidance, it has narrowed our range of action from all of these things, which weren't solving our problems, to a system of learning that would help us focus on what is the most productive path, what is the way forward. But it's not a set of do's and don'ts, and in the process of exploring this most productive way, we've made progress in the area of entry by troops. So the guidance that we get from the House of Justice focuses our action, but not in a way that's restrictive, in a way that liberates us to fulfill the potentialities that are inherent in the dispensation. Another way this either-or uh, imposes itself on Baha'i thought. Uh, our attitude, what is the Baha'i attitude toward other religions? 
are we right and they're wrong? Baha'u'llah gave us the truth. We have it. Therefore, they should all drop what they have and they should accept what Baha'u'llah says. Or did Baha'u'llah say, no, there's truth in every revelation. So therefore, we should have religious pluralism. We should support everyone. Which one is it? Is it this one or is it that one? And the answer is, it is neither this one nor is it that one. We have to throw out that either or in order to understand what the Baha'i writings are really telling us in, rela- in our relationship to other religions. First of all, the issue is about Baha'u'llah. It's not about the Baha'i faith as a religious community. Baha'u'llah has said that his teachings are for all the human race, not just for any one people, not just for any one population, and that mankind in its entirety has to accept these teachings that he brought, which are for the well-being of all and the way that society moves forward. He wrote to the followers of all religion, Ye are the fish of this ocean. Wherefore do ye you, do you withhold yourselves from that which sustaineth you? He calls all the people to him. Now, just as we understand this, this is Baha'u'llah's appeal to everybody. If we have it, we have to share it with others. We also respect the fact that people have their own conscience. Baha'u'llah tells us if somebody's not receptive, we cannot teach them. You see, we have to have a hearing ear. We have to have a receptive soul. We can't teach those who aren't receptive. And though if there is receptivity, the teacher helps people overcome those obstacles. Now, for those who don't want the Baha'i teachings, who don't wish it, well, there's still now the opportunity to consort with all people with friendliness and fellowship. We accept the truth, the divine truth of all of the revelations of the past, so it's no problem for Baha'is to embrace other religious communities, to accept them. If they don't want to have uh, anything to do with Baha'u'llah's teachings, fine. We can work together on common projects. We can work toward the betterment of the world. We don't have to impose our views. We have the opportunity to collaborate. We hope that they might learn something from the insights that Baha'u'llah gives, and that might make them better Christians, better Jews. The possibility also exists that we will learn from them as well, and we will become better Baha'is, because it will give us insights, ways of thinking that are not in our community. And so when we look back At Baha'u'llah's teachings, what do we see? Not that Baha'u'llah's teachings change as a a result of this encounter, but our understanding of what Baha'u'llah said changes and hopefully grows closer and we get better insights and understand more deeply what he shared. And then, of course, we know this teaching from Baha'u'llah that he should, that the seeker, the, the true seeker should forgive the sinful and never despise his low estate. For none knoweth what his own end shall be. How often hath the sinner attained at the hour of his death to the essence of faith, and quaffing the immortal draught, hath taken his flight unto the concourse on high. And how often hath the devout believer at the hour of his soul's ascension been so changed as to fall in the nethermost fire. So there's no judgment on our part. We can't even judge our own future. So uh, in this sense, you see then, this either or doesn't exist. It's a completely different thing when we step away from this imposed way of looking at reality and see reality as quite a different thing. Now in the closing minutes, I just want to summarize uh, in a certain sense the path that lies before us with this different conception of knowledge. We have these five aspects, and I'm sure there's many more if we had time to think about it. We have an understanding of the nature of revelation, uh, that the kingdom of God is a social reality that we have to build in the world and build human understanding and agreement about, that human knowledge is limited. It's limited in the capacity to understand the world and understand the revelation that there's a role of consultation in, uh, in clarifying our, and deepening our understanding and justifying our understanding and learning how to apply the teachings in the world. 
And there's also the importance of action as we test our ideas in reality and see what works rather than clinging to abstract ideas that don't tend to get us anywhere. And as we interact in these ways, we walk a path from the dawn of the dispensation all the way to the end of this dispensation. Now, in a certain sense, if we stretch ourselves a little bit, we can try to understand what did Baha'u'llah face when he came to get these human beings to walk this path. He doesn't uh, have the luxury of working with other than human beings. Sorry. We're limited. We're selfish. We're self-centered. We have all these faults as well as all these potentialities. So there's no magical formula or recipe. You can't wave a magic wand. There are spiritual forces, but these spiritual forces are precisely to help real human beings discipline themselves, to pray and to reflect on themselves and improve themselves over time. And when we make mistakes and hurt each other's feelings, because we love Baha'u'llah, we forgive each other and we're willing to start again. And when we're sitting in consultation and we like to yell at that other guy across the table, we don't yell for the sake of Abdu Baha. Not because we wouldn't feel good about it, but because we discipline ourselves and we don't do it. So Baha'u'llah has to work with such human beings. How does he do it? Okay, He's trying to create this social reality, the kingdom of God on earth, where the social structures, the institutions, the economic order, the political order, the social order, family life, everything is centered on the will of God. And he starts out in a time of chaos, when people don't have common agreement, when they're confused, and he gives us a revelation, and he sets us off on this path. So our job, then, is to walk that path. On the one side, Shoghi Effendi warns us about a danger of... Uh, extreme orthodoxy, again, a kind of a fundamentalist certainty that we know the truth, and we're going to impose that on everybody. On the other side is this danger of irresponsible freedom. You know, we want to do what we want to do. That, that freedom to teach any way we want that never got us the way to sustain the process of entry by troops. And along this path, there aren't any magic formulas. There's no roadmap. What we have is guidance from the revelation, also from the House of Justice, we study that guidance. We consult on it. We come to an understanding of what it means, and then we act on it. We test our understanding in action. Then we reflect on our action, and we study some more, and we consult some more, and we act again. This process of learning, study, consultation, action, and reflection, continues over the course of the entire dispensation. It's about translating that which hath been written into reality and action. And it involves not just our understanding of the faith and our practice of the faith, but ultimately all the disciplines of human knowledge. As we engage, as we study the sciences, as we study history, as we study economics, all the various fields, education, we have to learn what science has to tell us. We have to infuse those with Baha'i concepts in an exchange of views that shapes our own understanding of the revelation. In this sense, knowledge can be considered something quite different than this solid rock of a foundation. On the one hand, this idea of certain knowledge is like a foundation that we build on. And when that foundation gets challenged and it breaks down, all of our understanding breaks down. And so we fall into the water, and in a relativistic way, we bob along the way. But this idea of knowledge as it comes through the revelation, we can think of it as a kind of a raft, all right? We stand on this raft, we navigate the river. The secure beams of this raft are the statements in the revelation. They're immutable, they can't be changed by us. But to that, we have to add all kinds of thoughts and understandings. We build on this raft. And after a time sailing down the river, we see that certain pieces of it don't work. So we toss it out and we change those things. We can't toss out the major beams of the revelation. But maybe we reorder them because we now understand what Baha'u'llah said to us or what Abdu Baha and Shoghi Effendi said to us in a different way. So we navigate this river, this path, and we constantly change. Our knowledge evolves and develops and unfolds over time. We can see this in our learning about the process of entry by troops. There aren't any recipes. There's no formula 
to what the House of Justice has given us. But for the past 10 years, we've been learning in action how to combine this study, how to combine this consultation, this reflection, this action into ever more effective patterns. The House of Justice guides us. We step into the field of action. We learn something. This learning comes back, flows back to the World Center. In 1996, the House of Justice talked about the idea of uh, the Institute should have courses in a central place and at a distance. Now, how do you have courses at a distance? Well, we didn't know how. And then some countries did it, and they came up with the idea of study circles. Two years later, the document that the House of Justice shared at the International Convention called for national communities to have these study circles. We didn't know, and now we know. At the beginning of the five-year plan, the House of Justice talked about the importance of establishing intensive programs of growth. But we didn't know what an intensive program of growth was like. It was supposed to balance expansion and consolidation. Well, the House of Justice was telling us to balance expansion and consolidation since 1964, and we never could figure out how to do it. And at the beginning of the five-year plan, we still didn't know how to do it. But then we acted in the world, and we learned. And out of that experience, out of the efforts to put the guidance into action, certain productive patterns emerged. And the teaching center was able to write a letter and summarize some of those insights of learning, these uh, cycles of uh, intensive programs of growth that would focus on planning and intensive expansion activities and consolidation and, and the reflection and the cycle would repeat itself and so on. And now, out of the 17,000 clusters, we have 200 and some clusters that have actually established intensive programs of growth, something we didn't know how to do in 2001, something we do know how to do now, and something we're going to have to learn how to do better and better in the next plan and in the plan after that and in the plan after that until we can sustain the process of entry by troops in cluster after cluster around the world. In this process, the RUHI curriculum has emerged as an effective program. Why? Because the pedagogy at the heart of those materials touches in a profound way on these concepts of knowledge that, that I've talked about today. It's not just a body and it's of encyclopedic knowledge about the faith. It's a way of understanding, talking with others about the meaning of the text, translating it into effective action so that you are able to visit somebody in their home, share with them some prayers, teach a children's class, teach the faith in an effective way, not just proclaim some ideas, but guide a receptive soul along this process where they embrace the faith. And most importantly, to become a tutor and help other people walk this path of learning, the acquisition, and practice uh, application of knowledge. Now, in the process, we've been raising these institutes, which the House of Justice has called centers of learning. Right now, they're focused on learning about how to advance the process of entry by troops. How do we raise up human resources who can advance this process? But the House of Justice has also pointed out that these institutes, in time, can develop human resources for social and economic development. So gradually we begin to learn about education, or about uh, microenterprise, or about primary health education, or about moral education, or the advancement of women. And what that does is create an institution a center of learning in every population in the world where they're learning how to translate that which hath been written into reality, in the front lines, in the real world. And as they learn and become productive, that learning flows to the regional level, to the national level, to the international level, and back out again to all the different institutes around the world. So we have vehicles, institutions, that are guiding a process of learning about how to create a divine civilization as they grow and evolve and uh, continue to unfold over the course of the dispensation. So what we've learned about is learning about how to learn, how to walk a path in light of the divine guidance. The guardian told us that we have to trust the time and the guidance of the universal house of justice for a real understanding of the revelation and how to put it into effect. This time is an idle time. It's not just, oh, we don't understand. Let's wait around and see what happens, and later on we'll find out. 
It's time consumed by action and experience and experimentation and making mistakes and not knowing where to go. Everything's kind of cloudy right now. We have to try different things until the way forward becomes clear and then we act again. In this process, the House of Justice is not omniscient. It doesn't have a crystal ball. It's not going to give you a formula or a recipe. It's not distilling a fixed set of doctrines, a set of do's and don'ts that everybody has to abide by. It sets the direction so that the friends can learn, so that they can think deeply, so that they can act, and so their own experience feeds back into this constant process of social evolution and learning. The House of Justice guides us and keeps us on this straight path as we learn over time to gain better understanding and action in order to know God's will and to achieve its purpose. Now, the last decade, this 10-year period, has in a way uh, marked a historical turning point, in my view, in the history of the faith. To me, again, these are all personal views, it's kind of like the human race before the empirical science, sciences were created and after. We had knowledge, we had reason, we were able to advance. But once we learned about these rules and methods and processes of empirical science, then we could advance in a much more accelerated way, particularly in this avenue of uh, our, our mastery of the material world. Well, if we think in terms of the Baha'i dispensation, we've learned something in the past 10 years, or more particularly in the last five years. We've learned how to learn, how to be systematic, how to connect ourselves to the guidance that we get in the divine teachings and in the universal house of, from the universal house of justice, and to learn how to translate that into effective action and learn from our own experience and to build a global network of learning. Now, right now, we're learning about the process of entry by troops, but gradually that learning will spread to all aspects of what it takes to build a divine civilization. Now, Abdu'l Baha, in a statement in The Secret of Divine Civilization, provides a wonderful quote that I think will urge us along in this path of learning. He says, How long shall we drift on the wings of passion and desire? How long shall we spend our days like barbarians in the depths of ignorance and abomination? God has given us eyes that we may look about us at the world and lay hold on whatsoever will further civilization and the arts of living. He has given us ears that we may hear and profit by the wisdom of scholars and philosophers and arise to promote and practice it. Senses and faculties have been bestowed upon us to be devoted to the service of the general good, so that we, distinguished above all other forms of life for perceptiveness and reason, should labor at all times and along all lines, whether the occasion be great or small, ordinary or extraordinary, until all mankind are safely gathered into the impregnable stronghold of knowledge. Thank you.